Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. I was discussing auto sales the other day with a friend of mine, and we were talking about how one thing happens over and over again, and the problem that we hear about in the field of consumer protection, because the guy I was talking to was an attorney, is how problems could have been resolved or avoided if something had been put in writing. If something had been put in writing. So the title of this video regarding a piece of paper, although it looks like clickbait, actually is not. Because a simple piece of paper would resolve many of the problems that people encounter if they simply use the piece of paper correctly. But they won't. But you can learn from this. And sometimes you can't necessarily do what I'm going to tell you here that you should do. But knowing what you're getting yourself into, you'll understand it better once we go through this process. So the idea is that if something is put in writing, it has a much more deeply meaningful and legal effect than if it's not. A number of times I've had people tell me, clients, potential clients, people want to tell me their stories. They say, Steve, I bought a car. I did this. I did that. I did something where I got ripped off and they told me something. They told me something. And I say, oh, did you get that in writing? And of course, they say, no. Otherwise, they would have said, I got it in writing. Instead, they said, they told me something. And I always say, well, you know, there's a problem there. There's actually several problems there. But I've had people say, well, Steve, they said it in front of witnesses. That might not help either. In our society, in our culture, we treat things that are in writing differently than things people say. Okay? Things people say, it's very, very ephemeral disappears, it goes off into the ether, it's gone. If you put something in writing, it is somehow a little bit more permanent. It's not completely permanent. It's not carved in stone. (laughs) Even that's not necessarily completely permanent. Stones will crumble over time. But the point is that something that's been put in writing can be shown to somebody else, say, look, this is what we agreed to. And that's the key. What do you agree to when you talk about buying a car and then you buy a car? That's, and I'm going to use that example. This could apply to buying anything, buying widgets, buying homes. Home disclosures might vary from state to state. Of course, car buying might vary from state to state with respect to what documents get created. But the key here is this, is that if you are talking to somebody and you're negotiating, okay, I'm a buyer, you're a seller, okay? We're negotiating the terms of our purchase, of our sale, of our contract to purchase a widget, a thing, whatever it is, okay? And as we negotiate, we finally come to terms that we agree on. And most people recognize those terms quite simply as being just the price, okay? You want me to pay a t- you know, $1,000, I want to pay 100 I offer you 200 you offer 800 We haggle, we, we strike a deal at 500 okay? We agree on the price, we shake hands, I hand you $500, you hand me the widget. It's now mine, the money is now yours, right? Well, that's not where this ever ends. Where it always ends is afterwards when there's something wrong with the widget, the car, the house, what, what may, you know, what it may be. And the buyer thinks that they're entitled to more than simple possession and ownership of the thing they bought. They think they're entitled to some kind of repairs or they think that somehow they weren't told something or they were promised something in connection with the sale. And so then that's what happens is, well, they told me, they told me. And here's the problem especially with automobile sales. Salespeople are notorious for saying things about the product. This is a car, right? It's a used car. It's it's a 2010 Nissan, right? So we can look at that. Yeah, we agree on that. And there's a price. We agree on the price. That's never the, well, it can be, but that's not, not the most common problem. Person drives the car off the lot and the car explodes. They bring the car back and the guy goes, you bought it as is. And the buyer says, no, but you told me if it ever broke down, bring it back to you. Well, first of all, if it actually said that, I'm not sure what that means, because unless they said we'll fix it at no cost to you. But the second thing is they go, I don't don't remember saying that. And and then when they call me, I said, you get it in writing? They say, of course not. So the first thing you need to remember about almost any negotiation you're having with anybody is when somebody says something important, the law might refer to that as a material thing, but something that's material to the contract, something important. You could, if you wanted to, ask them to say, hey, look, I have a piece of paper right here. Piece of paper. I've got a pen. How about we touch the pen to the paper and we write down what you're telling me and we both sign it so that there's no argument later about what you said. 
And the funniest thing of all is that you're going to see, especially in the used car market, where the salespeople will tell you that they cannot do that. They're not allowed to do that. It's against the law to do that. Their manager won't let them do that. But what it will prove to you is whether or not what they're saying is true. So if they tell you this is a one-owner vehicle, very, very simple concept. The vehicle was only owned by one person, meaning that the original owner is the person who owned it before the dealership got it. You will become the second titled owner in most states. So the salesman says to you, this is a one-owner vehicle. One is an objectively measurable number. It's the loneliest number, but it is objectively measurable. One, okay? Not kind of, one, okay? So if it's a one-owner vehicle, and they and the salesman says, this is a one-owner vehicle. As Like I said, as, as a test of veracity, go, hey, can we put that in the purchase agreement? Can we write that some one-owner vehicle? And I've had people tell me that they go, the weirdest thing, the guy wouldn't write it down even though it was true, <laughs> but it shows you the mindset. So anything they tell you, ask them if they'll write it down because if they won't write it down. You should immediately go, oh, it must not be true. And one of the, I know people say, Steve, but if, if you know they're not going to write it down, why ask? Well, it lets them know that you're onto them. So a salesperson standing next to a car and goes, look at this beautiful car. It's a one owner car. You say, you going to put that in the purchase agreement for me and confirm it's one owner car uh, I, i'm sorry i can't do that okay and stop saying things like that if you can't write them down you could write if it was truthful you could write it down couldn't you again i know most people aren't going to ask those questions that point blank but the point is it'll put them on notice that you're onto them that that stop okay if you're if you're if you're gonna tell me stuff that we can't write down it must not be true okay that that, that might be a better way of putting it so i have people say to me all the time they go steve it's not how it works I went in and negotiated with a guy. We, he made all kinds of promises to me. And then we signed a document. I got the car, drove off, something happened. I've got the right to go back and enforce those verbal promises. And I say, really? You think you do? In Michigan, I can tell you that almost every car dealer uses a pre-printed purchase agreement that are almost all drafted by a local association that has lawyers working for them. And they almost always contain two things Two clauses, the two clauses you must watch for in every contract. One is an integration clause that says specifically right on it, it'll say, this document is the complete understanding of the parties. Nothing not included on this document is part of the agreement. Only what is included on this document is in the agreement. Therefore, if it's not here, it doesn't count. So anything said by somebody that wasn't reduced to writing is not part of that contract. That salesperson could tell you anything. If it's not included in the contract, it's not part of the contract. Now, some people right now are going, Steve, the guy can't commit fraud or put a gun to your head. or Obviously not. What I'm saying is that when you want to go into court later and say, I had an agreement, we had an understanding, I've got a contract with that company. And a salesperson negotiated the contract with me. The judge is going to say, show me the contract. He's going to look at the piece of paper and go, oh, front, back, I don't see it on there. What are you talking about? And you're going to say, we had an understanding outside of that piece of paper. The judge is going to go, huh, right here it says, only thing that matters is what's in this document or on this document. And your understanding outside of the document is not here. Now, Many people say, Steve, then isn't that a conflict that gets resolved like against the drafter or something? No, no, because elsewhere in that document is your signature. You signed it. And in Michigan and in most states, if you sign a document, you're presumed to have read it, you agree to it, you understood it, then you signed it. And the fact that you signed it meant you agreed to make all the stuff that wasn't on the contract and leave it off the contract. You could have put it on the contract, but you didn't, and you signed it anyways. So that integration clause is going to get you every time. So the idea is, if there is something important to the contract, it needed to be put on the contract. Otherwise, it doesn't become part of the contract. Now, the other thing that's going to get you in Michigan and in most states, especially the sale of a used car, is that there's going to be another clause on the contract someplace that's going to say, Nothing said by the salesperson or the agent of the dealership or the representative, 
Nothing they say verbally or orally counts unless it's reduced to writing on this contract. So in other words, not only did they put the integration clause in that says, look, if it ain't on this contract, it doesn't count. They'll often put the backup on there that says, and we are specifically excluding things said by our salespeople that aren't reduced to writing here. So when you go into court, hypothetically, because no, no lawyer would take this case, when you go into court, you say, Your Honor, I talked to the salesman, and the salesman said, if the carver breaks down, I can bring it back, they'll fix it. The judge is gonna go, hmm, is that on the document? I don't see it, you know, I don't see it anywhere on the document. And there's an integration clause, meaning that everything's gotta be reduced to writing here. And you go, but he said it. I've got witnesses, I've got videotape. Let's assume for a moment you had a film crew there with a with a nice camera. And they filmed the guy saying this. The judge is going to go, yeah, but there's also a clause here that says nothing said by the salesman counts unless reduced to writing. Is it reduced to writing? No. But I've got a film crew. I've got witnesses. I've, I, I've you know, God himself will, will, will come into the courtroom and confirm the man said this. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It wasn't reduced to writing. And it's merely something said by the salesperson, which is explicitly disclaimed by the contract. The contract's, the contract's warning you. What they say to you doesn't count unless you can get them to write it here. So once they've got that there, you know, they're, 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 they're pretty good in defending these cases. So what I'd point out to you, most purchase agreements for automobiles will have a section on it that says other, other. And you often see them put things in there like the service contracts or things they're gonna try to sell you or other options. And then some of them also have what called, are called do bills or, or we owe. And it's a piece of paper. It often says we owe or do bill. And it's a promise to fix something. You buy the car and they say, oh, by the way, if you buy the car, I'll slap on a new set of tires. Well, to make sure they do that, they'll pull out a document that says, you know, do bill, one set of tires. And, and that piece of paper, if it's integrated into the contract, is enforceable. And dealerships have that. And they also have, like I said, a spot in the purchase agreement that says other. Okay. Well, here's how the game is played. You go into the dealership and you're looking at the car, you agree on the price and the salesman says something to you. Let's suppose he says, you know, like you, you drove it, test drove it. And while you're driving, the check engine light comes on. So he sends it around back. The check engine light is now off. And he goes, Hey, we fixed the check engine light. And you go, what'd you do? And he goes, I'm not sure, but they told me it's fixed. And you said, well, I have a problem. I don't want to buy a car with the check engine light that's on. He goes, no, no, it's off right now. Yeah, I know it's off, but I'm concerned it's going to come on on the drive home. And he says to you, if it comes on on your drive home, bring it back here and we will fix it. He says that to you in front of witnesses, film crew, in front of God. Okay? So you, you look at him and say, oh, okay. Can you put that on a do bill or a we owe? He's going to go, no, I can't do that because I'm not going to say that we are promising to fix something because it, it's, it's not broken. How can I promise to fix it if it's not broken? And you say, okay. On the purchase agreement versus other, can you write in if check engine light comes on within 48 hours, you know, we will pay to have the problem fixed. And watch how fast he says he can't do that. Can't do that either. No, we're not allowed to write in that spot. I've heard that before. I've heard that many times before that the salesperson told the buyer, we're not allowed to write in that spot. What's it there for then? Why is it there? You know, so the most important thing to understand about it transaction like this is how important the piece of paper is. The piece of paper is the contract that gets signed, the purchase agreement. It might be two-sided, but it's got four corners. Flip it over four corners. And very, very clearly, if you sign that document, you are presumed to have read it, understood it, and agree with it. Those are the three things I keep pointing out here. Along with those three things are going to most likely be two clauses that most people don't think about or don't notice. And that is the integration clause that says, doesn't matter what happened prior to this moment, we're going to reduce everything to writing and this is our complete understanding. This is it. What's in these four corners, we all agree to. What's outside the four corners, we do not agree to. And the number two thing is the clause that says, nothing said to you orally, verbally, by words coming out of the mouth, Nothing said to you by a salesperson or a rep or even a dealership owner. Nothing said by talking counts 
It's not part of this contract and can only be part of the contract if it's reduced to writing. So it gets them specifically excluded from the number one argument people used to make and when they said, well, I agreed to this contract, but the guy told me something else. And I've even heard from people who said, Steve, the guy told me I could ignore those two clauses. Well, if that's true, that I can ignore those clauses, can I draw a line through them and we'll both initial that? Oh, no, of course we can't do that. (laughs) So a piece of paper can have a ton of power at the closing of an automobile purchase, house purchase, or what have you. But the important thing to realize is that you probably won't get to alter that document the way you'd like. But if you want to find out how truthful someone's being when they're selling you something, ask them if they'll put it in writing on a piece of paper and sign it. And watch how fast they say they can't do that. And that's when you realize how valuable or meaningful their words are when spoken. Because their words spoken are utterly meaningless. And I've said before, jokingly, that when a salesperson's talking, you can ignore everything they say. Everything they say. Because none of it is enforceable according to their own contract. And I've had people also say, Steve, you can tell they're lying to you because their mouth is moving and words are coming out of it. Eh, I'm not going to say everything they tell you is a lie, but nothing they say is enforceable. And so at that point, why are you listening to them other than just to hear them talk and just, you know make small talk and banter? So there you go. That's why a piece of paper is so important. And what's written on it is important. And what's said around it is irrelevant. So there you go. Questions, comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Leto's Law. Say hello to my little friend.